Hey, JJ here with The Art of Value. Today I'm going to talk about Jim Chanos, fam- famed short seller Jim Chanos on Tesla, Bitcoin, crypto, and fintech risks. Risks to all those. Further risks is current thoughts because it's a new interview. And so if you're on Twitter, watching this on Twitter, do click one of the links in the tweet to go to the full episode. Okay, let's get into it. So yesterday, this is part two. Yesterday I just did part one of the, it's a lot, it's like a, it's an hour long, so this is part two, the second half hour really. And interestingly, I found that, well I found that the interview fascinating, and it's, I'm going to jump a lot up here, he talks about Tesla last, but I'm going to talk about it first. What he said about it, the question of course was, you were short Tesla for a long time, you paired back when it went to the moon, now it's come down. It's the bellwether of Kathy Wood's folio, portfolio. And uh, Jim says, yes, they will survive in 2018. That was in question, and they admit that later. I do think it's now a bellwether stock in the market, like Cisco was in 1999, where people were putting their hopes and dreams on it. It's the time, it's the same now with EVs and solar and what have you. Tesla is the one-stop shop for that. I remember Cisco back then in the, uh, you know, in the dot-com bubble. It was talked about every day as the people's hopes and dreams. As they, uh, at this point, he says they are past the tipping point. However, in term meaning that it will survive. However, it's a big and it's a big. However, they are dramatically over-earning right now. The risk of the stock is. Accordingly, Tesla still tra- still trades at almost 10 times revenues and 30 times gross profit. It's trading like a SaaS company, but it is an auto company. It has gross margins of 30%. The risk they have is that it almost that almost every other auto company in the world has gross margins of 20% or thereabouts. So Tesla so Tesla trading at a, is trading at a monster multiple of a profit stream that's going to get competed. That is the risk for Tesla. It has it has become just an established EV company among a bunch of established EV companies. Well, not really yet, I don't think, but it, it could definitely be they're getting their act together, which is what he says. And one thing, uh, one thing that many people thought is that one, that none of the OEMs would ever get their act together. And certainly for a while they didn't, but now with the advent of Ford and the F-150 Lightning, that's a pickup truck if you don't know, and lots of other products that are uh, that are both out and coming, it's going to be the auto industry. And make no mistake, Tesla is a car company. They're building car plants and it's capital intensive. There's another risk to Tesla, he says, that I think is underappreciated by the market. And that is that Tesla... Uh, turned the profitability corner when it opened the China plant, and we and others have a suspicion that a large amount of the profits are coming out of Shanghai, and that raises all kinds of other risks to the multiple, and whether they can actually get their hands on the money, meaning get it back to the US, I suppose, or get it out of there. Gross profit margins took off as soon as Shanghai started volume production. It doesn't really explain any more than that, but you know, the fact that it's in China and uh, you know, money coming back to the US, US shareholders, I think they, he's talking about that. So, and they did ask, do you have a short position on Tesla now? He says, yes, we're short. We have a, we have a put position. I think he said that, he said that under, the, he was talking, one of the hosts was talking over him, so I think that's what he said. But he definitely said, we have, yes, we're short. What's the best historical analogy? And then start talking about crypto next. That's all he had to say about Tesla. Crypto. What's the best historical analogy for for crypto? Beanie babies. He joked. No, that's that's NFTs. Sorry, who thinks NFTs like beanie babies? The thing about alternative monetary systems at the, is is that there is a history of them. They tend to be embraced, adopted, and recommended in good times, not bad times. The first well, that's true, but I might say that Bitcoin was, you know, 
during the financial crisis. Is I think 2009 was kind of when it emerged, so it emerged from there. But yeah, it did get uh, recommended, embraced, and adopted as things got better. The first person to think about this was John Law, perhaps the greatest financial criminal of all time. So John Law, if I, I've you know, read books about financial bubbles, I think it's the Mississippi bubble, which is not to, no, it's not to do with Mississippi, it's in France, and the debt had a lot to be involved. But he, he says that Law wrote, he wrote about it in 1705 with the nature of, of fiat currencies, on the nature of fiat currencies. He said in times of stress, people will embrace government fiat because the government can adjudicate fraud and contracts in a situation where nobody trusts anything. You want to go, you want the government to back things like deposit insurance, where deposit insurance being that if you have money in a bank account, say in the US and other places in the world, if uh, if things go, if the bank goes, if things go bad economically, the government will back back your money in the bank. I think it's two hundred and fifty thousand in the US. It's, uh, it's uh, like one hundred and fifty thousand some other places. I think the Australia brought it in for two hundred and fifty during the financial crisis. So government backed uh, deposits stop banks from going under, or give give investors or deposit holders some. Uh, you know, confidence. Anything, it's an important, yeah, and you think about crypto, things that have gone under lately, uh, there's no insurance there, you just lost your money. Uh, it's an important concept we forget when everything is going to the moon and we are making money, a lot of money speculating. Crypto, con crypto concepts are a bit like this. I've called it a predatory junkyard and I stand by that. And uh, about Bitcoin in particular, they asked the future of money, is it the future of money or a Ponzi scheme? Uh, can How can two people come to wildly different conclusions about what it's worth, but about its worth and value? That's just talking generally about, you know, people are either, I like, uh, think it's the future of money, like Peter Thiel, for instance, and all those VCs that are backing uh, the eco ecosystem around, ecosystems around it. And then people who think it's a Ponzi scheme like uh, like him and uh, Buffett and Munger. Bitcoin is like the dollar of the crypto space, he says. The ecosystem built around it is clearly just rent is clearly just rent seeking. That's been my criticism of the whole space, not necessarily Bitcoin in particular, but the ecosystems around Bitcoin and crypto. The high fees, for instance, I've been publicly short Coinbase, he says, because. They've been over earning again, like Tesla, a vast ecosystem that sprung up to basically extract fees from prim primarily unsuspecting retail investors. Uh, exa an example he gives, well, co but, uh, Coinbase, which he said is short retail trading volume that uh, that huge is huge compared to institutional volume. They earned one billion in commission in Q1 2022 from retail. And only 50 million from institutional investors. One dollar value of trade and volume retail is paying more. Retail retail is paying more than 60 times the rate of institutions. This is borderline predatory behaviour, he says. In the industry, fees and everything else are outrageous. My complaint is with all the circus is with all the circus around it, not necessarily the currency itself or the the asset itself. And I see this week, uh, I think Chris Bloomstrand on Twitter was, was uh, attacking, criticizing Coinbase's executives for cutting jobs. Not for cutting the jobs, but he said that, you know, the found, picture of the founder having a, a like a hundred and something million dollar house in Beverly Hills. Uh, excuse me. And... Uh, and things like that, and not you know not cutting back executive pay and that sort of thing. So, and the next topic is fintechs. The fintechs he has things as risky fintechs. What this, what it's all, what is it about fintechs? Fin, fintechs that you see as egregious valuations. They ask him. It boils down to since since the it boils down to since the advent of the internet, it has been, uh, it has boiled down to figuring out. What people who generally don't pay back their that people who don't generally pay that back their loans, we have they say we have algos and 
algos, algorithms and data and all these things that legacy ban banking hasn't figured it out and we're going to get people to pay it back, pay us back. Every down cycle since 1998 has been those companies, has seen those companies blow up because they didn't have a better mousetrap at all. They just had the credit cycle at their back. The algos didn't, didn't work when things got tough, and I don't think this will be any different. I see the narratives by the companies that claim they've figured it out again. The reality is that 12 years of easy credit and consumers getting flush with government payments, all kinds of things, everyone looks like every everyone looks like great credit when everything's going well with credit at the back. It's not until things get tough that you see where the risks are in, in your portfolio, meaning the portfolio of the companies of their people have loaned money to. Uh, this was just this was just another way for Silicon Valley to tell another to tell another narrative. The first fintech companies came out in 1998, 99. And of course, I'm thinking, this is me talking, The uh, it's when PayPal came out with Peter Thiel and Elon Musk and others who were at PayPal, the PayPal Mafia, as it's called. And so PayPal did work and they did have trouble. I remember then uh, hearing stories of that they got funding just before the, the dot-com bubble bust, but it was pretty tight. And they ended up getting it, and it kind of saved them through it. But of course, PayPal did did uh, did last, and it's a huge company today, down at the moment. Some people say it's good value buying at the moment, not financial advice. But what I'm saying is, some fintechs, those fintechs, did survive. Some, not not all of them. Obviously, there were there were some, but I'm saying that's an example of one that did. So about shorting. Does the business look problematic when everything should be going its way? That's that's the odds in the skeptic's way. Um, so he's saying that, you know, the past few years, these, these companies that should have had everything going for them uh, and they still couldn't really make money. If you're, a, if you're a food delivery company and you're not making money when people are throwing money at you and everybody is at home, maybe you have an issue and maybe the model just doesn't work. So we're looking for businesses with really low return on invested capital. The big, it's a big thing we focus on. For, for most corporate, Amer most of corporate America, that number is in double digits, low to mid teens. If you're going, if you're getting three, four, five, six percent on capital at the top of the business cycle and rates are only two, three percent, you're going to be in trouble. He's implying as rates go up. And so, yeah, return, like uh, return on capital employed, for instance, is me, not him. Uh, I think the, the average for the S&P 500 is around 15. So, you know, a lot of value investors do look for high return on capital employed, like, uh, or not even value investors. I mean, Terry Smith from Fundsmith doesn't call himself a value investor, but he looks, that's one of the criteria they look for, one of the few, that that's a very high return on capital employed. And some, you know, a lot of this, they have like 25%. So, and they're looking for that. So, two, three, four percent is really low. We look at the macro and understand that there will be cycles and find companies that are unprofitable or barely profitable when things are good. It's because uh, obviously, when things are bad, it all goes south and it's a good short possibility. The use of pro forma metrics is also problematic, it's getting worse and worse through the aggressive use of self-defined metrics, the most egregious, egregious of which is adding back share-based compensation. Silicon Valley is lavish in using it. Uh, it's, we pay people, if we pay people in, people in stock, this doesn't count. They say they'll be, they'll be adjusted EBITDA, EBITDA uh, positive at some stage in the future. And then you look at the numbers, and they're losing hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's what he has to say about that. Interesting. Uh, so he, he basically thinks that fintechs, uh, the fin, fin, there's a lot of fintechs that might run into trouble. If we think it's, you know, uh, there's a bear market now, but let's see what happens. And so this was actually at the beginning of um, of the talk, but I'm going to talk about it. At the end, there's a comparison to 2008, which relates to that, to fintechs. They asked him, uh, what's the degree of leverage out there? They asked him, especially in something like crypto. So 
you know, is Leverage's debt a problem at the moment? Uh, he says the warning signs are, were everywhere in, in 2006-7 because you could see it on balance sheets of banks and brokers. They were just getting more and more levered. We regulated the US banking system pretty tightly after the GFC. So I don't, so I, I don't see there's systematic bank risk out there. Which is good to hear. It's much more diffuse in things like crypto. If, is there hidden leverage in that system? My guess is that there is, and we'll find out probably shortly. And of course we've talked, excuse me, <coughs> Talked about uh, Michael Saylor and uh, MicroStrategy having possibly ma on margin uh, for their position and at the level of 21,000 uh, 21, being being problematic for margin calls. But we just I don't know. I, it's just speculation, I think. Or I think maybe the CFO of the company said it, but I don't know what. We just don't know. We'll find out if it goes down a lot more. We'll find out. The shadow banking world of fintech too. I've been joking for a while. Fintech is simply subprime lending done on an app. But every bull market has its own flavor, and this one is not as debt-driven as the banking system. So he's so referring to the GFC and subprime there. The risk, the risk might be rate risk, not debt risk this time. We will have to see. Geopolitical issues are different too, like China and the land war in Europe. So yeah, rate risk meaning that interest rates are going up um, and can these companies handle it uh, no a lot of people just were not expecting uh, we're not expecting rates to 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 be on the rise and suddenly inflation's taken off and rates are going up okay the last thing is about regulators saying uh, they are they're always behind the ball saying that uh, you know the quiz they question should the SEC be uh, do something about Elon Musk and crypto why don't the regulators get more involved? And he says regulators are financial archaeologists. Five years later, they'll tell you they'll tell you what went wrong. When stock prices are going up, they get accused of of stifling innovation if they do anything. It's not until investors start losing money that they start getting upset. Okay, we'll leave it there. So, if you found any value in this, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Hit the notification bell on on Spotify. Follow and on. Uh, audio, all the other audio apps, Apple and whatever your favorite platform. Uh, follow along and join me at the Art of Value on Twitter. Okay, thanks. See you next.